welcome to KMC. My name is Travis Capture. I'm the associate pastor here, and we're glad that you're joining us for this new series that's going to take us all the way up uh, to Easter, and it's Meet Jesus. Uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at the kingdom of God, and I pray that you guys are um, going to participate with us throughout this series, and, and feel free to invite people that um, you know that need to meet Jesus. Well, as far as a welcome this morning, I've got some really exciting news. Um, I mentioned probably a month or so ago that we'd we'd be having an app coming, and it's here. So, if you'll direct your attention to the screen, this is Church by Ministry One. If you get this on the App Store or the Google Play um, Center, you can download it. It's free. And then when you when you do so, when you go to it, it will ask you to search for a church. All you do is search for Kalamazoo Missionary Church. And then on there, you will find um, ways to give, to contact us and send prayer requests, and um, to find our sermons. Our sermons will now be live streamed on there, and it also has a backlog of all of our previous sermons. Speaking of which, if you head over to our website, kzumc.org, things have been revamped there as well. You will find sermons live streamed on that as well, um, with also last week's um, right there easy for you in the sermons tab. And if you click on the give now or donate tab, um, giving is going to look a little bit different. We have a new service, but it's fairly easy. Um, and we encourage you guys to go over there and check that out. Uh, YouTube is still a thing that we're doing, but if you go over to YouTube, type in Kalamazoo Missionary Church and click subscribe. Again, the more people we get to do that, um, the better things we can do. We have youth tonight from 5 to 6.30 here at the church, uh, grades 6 through 12. So we encourage you uh, to join us then. And then if you stay after service, um, we are going to have a vote on James as an elder, and we're going to look at the church financial situation. So thanks again for joining us this morning. I pray that you hear from God this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Good, good. My name is Joel. Welcome to Kalamazoo Missionary Church. My name is Joel. I'm one of the pastors here. Thrilled that you guys are joining us uh, this morning. Uh, both those who are here in the room and those who are home watching online on any one of our three platforms that we're currently... And, and here's what I have found. There are a lot of folks uh, who know about Jesus, right? Uh, if, we, if we are walking uh, down the street and we see people, and if we were to ask them, hey, do you know who Jesus is? More than likely, they would say yes. There's a lot of folks who know about Jesus. But I think there is a much less percentage of people who really know him personally, who know who he is, who know uh, what he did, who knows why it matters. Um, so that's what this morning and the next six weeks are going to be all about. We're going to be taking a look at some of the things that Jesus has done and using these stories to help understand him better. And, and for those of us who, who know him, uh, it'll be an opportunity for us to deepen that relationship, to deepen our relationship with him. And for those who don't know him, it will give them an opportunity to understand exactly who Jesus is, right? And why it just might make sense for them to consider following him. So uh, the other thing I want you guys to think about during the next few weeks is that if you know someone, maybe a friend or a family member who doesn't, know Jesus, then, then these next six weeks might be a really good time to invite them either to come to church here or to check us out online on one of our platforms there so that they can begin to learn about him. Uh, and we're just kind of going to take, do a very basic, very basic, this is who Jesus is. But let's start this morning. Uh, we're going to start this morning with a responsive reading. This is out of the book of John. Uh, 
out of the book of John chapter 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's open this morning with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for our time together today to worship you. We thank you for uh, the ability that we have to come together to do this. We thank you for our church family. We thank you for everyone who was able to make it here this morning in person. We thank you for everyone who's watching us online today. Lord, we thank you for all of the many blessings that you've poured out upon us, God. Thank you so much for that. And as we dive into your word this morning, Lord, I ask that you open our minds to what it means. I ask that you open our hearts to what you have for us in them and ask that you open our spirits to where you're leading us today. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this passage that we just read together out of the, is out of the book of John, and it is a description of who Jesus is. And everything that we know about Jesus, we find in the Bible, right? And the Bible has two major sections. The first part of the Bible is the Old Testament, and the second part is called the New Testament. And the Old Testament is, as you may have guessed, it's older, Right? And it talks about God and his relationship with the world before Jesus was born. Uh, the New Testament is similar in that it still talks about how God interacts with the world, but it's different in that it does it through the viewpoint of Jesus. You see, when Jesus was born, everything changed, including how God interacted with the world. Now, at the very beginning of the New Testament, then, we find four books that are collectively known as the Gospels of Jesus. The passage we just read is from the Gospel of John, and the passage we're going to look at this morning and study is from another Gospel, the Gospel of Mark. So if you have your Bibles with you today, we'll be in Mark chapter 1. I encourage you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Now these Gospels are simply four different accounts of the life of Jesus written by four different people. And as you read them, it, it's clear that they all describe Jesus's life, but each of the Gospels emphasize a different aspect of Jesus's life. So, so we have four different points of view of the life of Jesus that's come down to us through the centuries. So like I said this morning, we'll be in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. Before we dive into that, though, I want to spend just a moment to talk about this word that I've used several times already, the word gospel, right? It is a word that when translated from Greek, it simply means good news. So we translate the word gospel into good news. So the gospels of Jesus are the good news of Jesus. And the Greek word we get the word gospel from, originally it was a military term. It was a military term. You see, back, back in those days when an army would march out from a city and battle with another army, if they were victorious, then they would send a messenger back to their home city, and that messenger would run up to the city and cry out, gospel. I mean, that, they would do it in Greek, but they would cry out, gospel, gospel, so that the people in the city knew that it was good news and that they didn't have to worry about an invading army coming down the road right? So originally that's uh, what the term was. Uh, and the people started hearing that word, and they knew that it meant good news. They knew that it meant victory, uh, and they didn't have to worry about the bad guys anymore. Well, over time, the word took on further meaning as Roman emperors began to declare things that they said were good news, right? They said were gospels. Uh, the Romans would make statements 
uh, that were heralded as this term. Eventually, uh, there, if it came to be that if there was a gospel, a piece of good news out of Rome, it meant that a new member of Caesar's family was born or a new emperor had ascended to the throne. That was the good news that Caesar was strong, the good news that the empire was being led well, and that the Romans could be assured of their place in the world because of the strength of the leadership of the empire. That was the word gospel. So when the New Testament writers, when Mark, in the first century, started using the word gospel to talk about Jesus, they were making a very bold statement about who Jesus was and, and how Jesus achieves victory over his enemies. And we see this, it, that in the book of Mark, the very first verse says this. It says in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark is starting off his account of Jesus' life by proclaiming gospel, proclaiming good news. He is subverting the term from what it meant in that culture and saying, look, there is something incredibly special going on here. And this is more important than a military victory. This is more important than a new emperor. This is the news of Jesus, the Son of God. That's Mark's opening statement about who Jesus is. It's powerful. It's subversive. It's very much action-oriented, which is how all of the gospel of Mark is written. He, he lays for, out for us a very straightforward account of Jesus' life. He doesn't spend time giving us any insight on what people are thinking or feeling. He doesn't really tell us why Jesus does the things that he does or gives us any explanations about the context of why those things would make sense. That's not how Mark writes. He simply lays out for us the stuff Jesus did and the stuff Jesus said. And in turn, we are left to fill in some of those gaps on our own and, and try and interpret those actions. And I think that that was done intentionally. I, I, it causes us to think about the nature of God and the character of Jesus as we look at his words and at his actions and consider why he does the things that he does and what he's trying to accomplish by doing those things, or, or why the Holy Spirit wanted these things recorded in the Bible, and what relevance those things have for us. Because of the very straightforward nature of Mark's gospel, we're left to figure that stuff out on our own, which I think is kind of fun. Um, but if we skip down from verse 1, we are going to look at today the story of Jesus' baptism, and it starts in verse 9. It starts in verse 9. It says this, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my Son, whom I love with you, I am well pleased. So Mark starts out his gospel by t introducing us to Jesus, saying he went to a river to be baptized by a guy named John. Now the verses we skipped over, we get a bit of an introduction into who John was and, and how he was baptizing Jews and telling them to repent of their sins, similar to what we did this past week on our Ash Wednesday service. You see, John had all the, the earmarks of a prophet of God. And his message was very, very simple. God wants you to change your life. God wants you to change your life. And, and he tells people that after he came, that there would be someone else coming who was greater than him, who was more important than him. Now, 
if a prophet was God's voice to the people, then it makes me wonder what possibly could be coming that would be greater than that. We see in verse 11 that as Jesus came up out of the water from being baptized, we see three things happen. Heaven was torn open, right? This is an unusual thing. Has anyone here ever seen heaven torn open? No? Okay, so not an everyday occurrence. The Holy Spirit visibly descended upon Jesus, right? Has anyone ever seen that happen to somebody before? No, another very unusual occurrence. And then there was a voice that came uh, out of nowhere that identified Jesus as God's son and declared that God was pleased with him. I'm going to just assume that no one's heard that voice shouting either. Okay. So what could be greater than a prophet would be God's own beloved son. I love to imagine, as I think about this story, I love to imagine the look on Jesus' face when he heard God saying this to him, right? I imagine his, his eyes lighting up and, and a smile slowly growing on his face. And I imagine uh, the love that he felt just kind of coursing through him when, when he heard this voice saying, you are my son, I love you, I am pleased with you. You know, occasionally, right, if I play my cards right as a dad, occasionally I can see something similar on the faces of my own children as, as I look in them and say, my boy, I love you. I'm so proud of you. They're wearing masks right now, we're in public, so it's not happening right now. But occasionally... Occasionally, I get to see that look on their face. And even today, as I thought about this, even today, if, if my dad were to call me up out of the blue and say, you know what, Joel, I just wanted to call and say that I love you and that I'm proud of you, I would still feel that way. Even today. I, I think there's something very, very amazing and special about that, and I feel like Jesus felt something similar uh, at that point in time. And, and I guess just to all the all the parents in the room, maybe that's a just a reminder for all of us that that a loving declaration from a parent goes goes a long, long way in affirming a child. So anyway, Mark uh, writes that. He, Jesus was declared to be God's son in verse 1. And then here in verse 11, we see the evidence for making that statement, right? But Mark doesn't like to dwell on things as he's writing, so he keeps the story moving, and we see a new scene happening. Verse 12, at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. So right after this miraculous scene with, with heaven tearing open and God's voice and the Holy Spirit and all that stuff, we see that Jesus was told to go to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Not the most happy marching orders that, that he probably could have gotten. Uh, and some of the other gospel accounts were given the nature of that temptation, but in Mark's account here, we're simply told that it happens and that there were uh, wild animals and angels involved in the process. Like I said, Mark's gospel doesn't give us a whole lot of why things happen. And one of the, but one of the reasons that I think that Jesus had to spend time in the wilderness being tested by Satan is because you and I spend time in the wilderness too, don't we? We spend, we spend time being tested by Satan ourselves, don't we? And I think that's one of the reasons why Jesus had to go through that process because God is a personal God who desires to show his love for us and he wants us to know that he knows what it feels like to be in those situations. And even in the times where he won't take us out of the wilderness or the times where he won't remove 
the testings, we can still gain comfort from the fact that Jesus has been there. And, and, and he has been right where we are. And when we're there, he'll be there with us. And I, I find great comfort in that. And then we see after that time of testing, the next two verses is kind of a, a summary of everything that Jesus is going to be preaching for the rest of of the gospel. It says in verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Believe the gospel. Mark lets us know that John was put in prison, but in his place, Jesus begins his preaching ministry, proclaiming the good news of God. And then in verse 15, he gives us what the good news is. The time has come. And another way to translate that would be the time has been fulfilled, right? So like this is a point in history that we've been waiting for. God's kingdom is here. God's kingdom is here. Is here. Mark here is summarizing all of Jesus' teachings in this one single concept, the kingdom of God. And if we read through the Gospels, we will find that Jesus talks about the kingdom of God constantly. It is his primary message. Jesus, with his life on earth, ushered God's kingdom into being. And as Jesus talks about God's kingdom, we learn that it is unlike other kingdoms. Entering God's kingdom isn't a change of address, but a change of heart. Of becoming something different than we were before. And I think that when Jesus says here that the kingdom of God is near... The, with the word near, he's not talking about a time difference. He's not saying it's going to happen tomorrow or the next day. It's not near that way. He's talking about a spatial difference. The kingdom of God is near, as in location. It's the person of Jesus who ushers in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was standing right next to them. And it's through him that we're able to see and to enter God's kingdom. And we see also in verse 15 that the two things we need to do to enter God's kingdom. First uh, is repent, which means we have to change our minds. We have to change the direction we're heading. We have to change our hearts about how we look at life. We have to turn away from the path that we've chosen for ourselves. But it also tells us what we need to turn towards. Belief in the gospel. Belief in the gospel. See, if we believe in the good news of Jesus, then we've come into the kingdom of God. So what do we learn then about Jesus from these stories of his baptism, his temptation, and declaration of the kingdom being near. I think the first thing we pick up on is that the story of Jesus is gospel. It's good news. It's a declaration that Jesus is God's son. The, the, that the news of Jesus is more important than any military victory. That the news of Jesus is more important than whoever the emperor is in Rome, that the news of Jesus is more important than what God's prophet would have to say. The news of Jesus is so important, in fact, that the world was never going to be the same after he was here. And in fact, the world never has been the same, has it? I think the, a second thing that we learn about Jesus in these stories is that Jesus has been where you and I are. He has been to the wilderness. He has fought spiritual battles with Satan. 
He has overcome Satan's attacks, and he has emerged victorious. And we see a glimpse here of of the reality of the spiritual warfare that is happening around us all the time. See, Satan and his followers are very much interested in bringing ruin to God's kingdom. And they know that the best way to do that is to attack you and I and turn us against God. And Jesus has been to the wilderness. He has fought that battle. He knows the enemy. He's defeated the enemy. And in his victory, Jesus offers those of us who follow him the ability to emerge victorious from our own wilderness experiences and our own testings and our own temptations. And make no mistake, if you choose to follow Jesus with your life, you will be attacked spiritually. It will happen. There will be times when Satan or one of his followers will focus on you and try and get you to stop following Jesus. And I think that there's a mistake in our thinking uh, in how Satan does this. See, Satan isn't all that interested in us making us following him. He's not saying, hey, don't follow God, follow me. That's not really how he does it. He wants you to follow yourself right he wants you to be selfish he wants you to be power hungry he wants you to be greedy he wants you to be apathetic towards other people in the world and when we do that then we become his followers because that's exactly what he did to God and we become just like him So we will deal with spiritual attacks. For most of us, those will be subtle and geared towards allowing us to get what we want rather than putting God first. That's how Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, and he uses the same method on us. And we need to remember when we're being offered anything that we want that Jesus emerged victorious over Satan. He emerged victorious from that battle, and he will help us to fight that battle as well. So not only is Jesus the Son of God, not only is he more powerful than any enemy, but he's also the person who ushers into the world God's kingdom. He gives you and I the opportunity to enter into a new way of life where the selfishness, the pettiness, the resentment, and the power-grabbing and struggles of evil human governance no longer dictates how we are to live our lives. Rather, we can follow Jesus and allow him to guide us into a kingdom that's full of love and peace and acceptance. Uh, I think that those are some pretty great things, yeah? Yeah? Three pretty great things that we've learned about Jesus just in this story this morning. But there's a lot more to learn about him. There's a lot more to know about him, which is why we're going to be spending the next six weeks taking time just to meet Jesus, to learn about him. So I really want to encourage you guys to continue to be here, to to continue to be part of this series, both those who are in the room and if you're watching online, continue to be with us. I invite you to plan on joining us next Sunday as well. But to finish off our time today, however, I have a question for each one of you this morning, and it's a question I'm going to ask every week of this series. Now that you've heard a little bit about who Jesus is, would you like to follow him? Would you like to follow him? Would you like to enter into God's kingdom? Would you like to experience Jesus at your side as you deal with temptation? Would you like to follow Jesus? 
If Jesus is someone that you want in your life, then I want to take just a minute and guide you through a prayer that will begin your relationship with him. So everybody bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for this ability to learn about you this morning. And we come to you this morning and ask you to forgive me, forgive us of all of our sins. Lord, I repent of my wrongdoing. And I believe that Jesus is God's son, that he ushered in God's kingdom and that through him I can begin a new life that honors you, that is committed to him. Thank you, God, for my new life. I pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us for Sunday morning service as we start this series and we meet Jesus. Well, um, I encourage you guys to check out our app. Again, it's Church by Ministry One. And if you search for Kalamazoo Missionary Church, you'll find it there. And there's a lot of cool new things we're going to do with that. If you head over to our website, we have a new uh, Give Now um, to set up reoccurring payments um, through that website. So I encourage you to do that. And our sermons will be live streamed on the church website as well, kazumc.org, if you want to share that with anyone who doesn't have uh, Facebook or you, access to YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, Kalamazoo Missionary Church there. If you hit the red subscribe button, we can start to do really cool things and I encourage you to like and share this video as well so that way Facebook um, we can get this uh, to as many people as possible and lastly we have youth tonight from 5 to 6 30 here at the church we're going to be finishing up our prayer series as we do some prayer stations um, we hope that you all have a blessed Sunday and we'll see you back here next week as we continue uh, to meet Jesus